Hi, my name is James Johnson, and I am the Chief Officer of Spiritual Development here at Honey Lake Clinic, and I want to thank you for joining me as we look at and explore the idea of reintegration and looking at how we can prepare to leave Honey Lake Clinic and return home. The reintegration process at first blush may sound simple, but it's actually a very complicated and intense process for most people that in the beginning they embark on this process of going home and returning back to their life and being with their loved ones again and going back to all of the things that they have put on hold during their time at Honey Lake Clinic. And once they actually get home, so many times they find out that they weren't prepared and they did not look ahead with the right perspective to make sure they were looking out for all of the potholes that come with the reintegration process. And as we look at this topic of reintegration, you may be thinking to yourself, man, why is a, a spiritual guy, why is a, a person looking from the spiritual lens teaching this class? And the reason for that is twofold. First, because as we'll see in just a little bit, the mindset and the perspective we take as we look at our life and we process the changes that have taken place during our journey at Honey Lake Clinic actually alters and grows and develops, sometimes even completely changes altogether our identity. And that is a very much a spiritual component of our life, how we see ourselves and how we look at the narrative of our lives as our life story. But the second reason that I get to teach this course is because I know a thing or two about reintegration. I'm a little bit of a subject matter expert because you see, as of this recording, I am a chaplain in the Army Reserves. I'm currently a major, and I am not saying that to brag on my rank. I'm saying that to brag on the experience that I have been blessed with over the years. As of this recording, I have served in the Army Reserves for over 15 years. I have taken numerous trips, trainings, missions, and deployments over this 15-year period of time. I have had the pleasure of serving across the United States with different mobilizations and trainings, working as a hospital chaplain, but I also have done overseas missions in Germany, Poland, and throughout the Middle East. And every time I come home, this process of reintegration is what I have to go through. How do I recognize that I am a different person? I am returning home changed. In my most recent deployment, the probably the longest one that I've had coming back from the Middle East, I was away from my family for almost a year from leaving home to returning home. And I remember as I returned home, the reintegration process, because of the length of time, was actually far more difficult than the past times because not only had my children grown, and you can look in these pictures to see pictures of my family and pictures of myself while I was you know, gone and then, of course, coming back home from this deployment, that life had changed. It had gone on without me. My family had grown and our children had gotten older and more mature. My wife had had to handle the business of our home and, and our the daily life. And she had learned how to do all of these things without me. And as I returned home, I had to learn not only who I was now, but what is our relationship like? What is our marriage like? How do I reconnect with my children and make up for the things that I missed while I was gone in their lives? How do I take the new skills and tools that I've learned and apply them, but also how do I make up for the hurts and the pains that I experienced along the way as well? You see, reintegration is a very complicated and complex thing, far more than we will have time to cover in this lesson. But the goal of this class today is for us to look at some of the basics to begin to put into your mind the things that you need to begin thinking about. As the old saying goes, failing to plan is planning to fail. And I don't want you to fail at this process. You have come too far in your journey towards health and wellness to allow a struggle and the, and the failures to plan properly with the struggles of reintegration to cause that to be a place of sabotage for you. 
So thinking about my experience, and I'll share one of them with you, that as I came home, because of the combat zones I served in, the experiences and interactions I had during this last deployment that I went on, I now was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. My PTSD caused me to think differently. My brain fog causes me to lose track of time, to forget things very easily, to get stressed out and anxious over complex procedures, to be worried and fearful of embarrassment and humiliation when I give presentations and I, and I lose track of time or if I have projects that I don't complete on time. I don't sleep like I did before, which meant that I was more tired and more irritable. I had spent an entire year almost without a single day off. I had one day off in that one year period because I was, I was sick and I was forced to go back to my sleeping area to rest. But every other day was high, what they call an op tempo in the military, high energy, high workload, go, go, go for a year. And when I came home, I had difficulty slowing down. I was very short and impatient. I had all of these mental struggles, and I had to learn how to appreciate the growth and the strengths that I had encountered. But I also had to recognize that I had changed. I was different. And one of the things that helped me with that was looking back on my childhood, I grew up loving stories of heroes, ninjas or knights in shining armor, superheroes, you know, comic books, action movies, all of these things were, were things I, I idolized and I, and I read all of these fantasy stories and, and novels and books and watched all these movies and TV shows and I loved heroes. And one of the things I recognized from my childhood and my years as an English teacher is that heroes always return home from their journeys and their quests changed for both good and bad. And the good that they come back with, with these newfound strength, these newfound treasures that they come home with, but they also come home changed because of the struggles and the injuries that they encountered and endured along the way. And it was this mindset of the hero's journey that allowed me to process my life story. And it actually began and created the spark of my doctoral research. My doctoral research was working on helping combat veterans treat moral injury and the internal conflicts they experience from their combat experiences. How can they come home changed for the better and also for the worse? And as we go through, this is what Joseph Campbell labeled the hero's journey. And in his book and his research, he looked at how the what he called the monomyth, this idea that all great stories tell a familiar pattern. They may use different characters and different plot sequences, different settings and environments, but they follow this same 12 step pattern. And we're not going to go into all of this today, but one of the important pieces of the hero's journey is what he called the road back, the return from the special world where the adventure takes place back to the ordinary world. For me, as a military soldier, the special world was where I was deployed in the Middle East and the different areas I visited soldiers in and operated in as a hospital chaplain the different combat zones and, and, and areas that I went into. That was the special world. But coming back to my home, to my family, to my previous life, that was returning back to the ordinary world. And if you look at where step 10 is on this picture, you can see that it's right on the line, right on the cusp where the road back starts when we leave the special world and come back to the ordinary world. Well, at Honey Lake, here at Honey Lake Clinic, this line is where you leave your home and you come to Honey Lake. This line is where you get ready to leave the clinic and it's full of all kinds of excitement where you pack your bags and you say goodbye to your friends and the staff members that you've, you've grown close to during your weeks at Honey Lake Clinic. And then you return home and you cross that line, you cross the threshold back to 
the real world, your normal world, whether that's getting in a car and driving home, taking a flight. I mean, I remember what it was like to get off that plane, and, and I was blessed. A lot of military veterans did not receive the homecoming I did. My family met me at the gate, and they were holding those signs. Maybe you saw it in the pictures on the last slide, and they wrapped me in their arms and we wept because we had missed each other and we had dealt with the fear of the possibility of me not coming home. And to come back home, it was such a joy as we cried together and we celebrated together. But there's also this new life that begins to take place. If you look at step 11 on this that, that I didn't circle, the resurrection happens that a resurrection is where somebody comes back from the dead they return back to life and that's what happened that i experienced this resurrection and you will too as you prepare to go home you will go through a resurrection of life where you leave the old life you the old life dies and the new life begins and so what we have to recognize as we think about this road back home. We have to recognize that the road back home, like every hero, means we return home from our journey changed. And I want to encourage you as I worked with these combat veterans for my doctoral research and we looked at this idea of narrative therapy that I want to encourage you to, to look at your life as a story. Look at your life as a narrative. And one of the things in the Christian perspective that we tend to do is we tend to make God the hero of our story. That yes, Jesus is our savior, but God has given each one of us a unique individual life story that we live out. That as we live the day-to-day -day events of our life, it's like the chapters of a book, and God has given us our own unique life to live. And so I want to encourage you to begin to think of yourself as the hero of your journey. Does God help us? Absolutely. Does God give us allies and support and, and, and all of these tools? Yes, he does. But it is our story. It is our life that we are living. And in your life story, what I want you to understand is that every single one of us, like the heroes in the stories, come home changed. That when you complete the quest of your Honey Lake journey, you return home changed. Some of these changes are going to be for the better. When I came home because of the places I had been and the things I had seen, man, I appreciated my family more than I did before I left. I appreciated my wife and her strength and her courage and her ability to keep our family together, knowing that as I went through many dangerous places and, and confronting this reality that, that there's a pretty real chance that, that I might come home physically harmed or might not even come home alive at all. You see, some of these changes were for the better. I appreciated life. I appreciated our home. I appreciated my job. I appreciated our, the things that God had blessed us with. I was so much more thankful and had so much more gratitude. But some of the changes were for the worse. I came back with PTSD. I came back with moral injury. I came back with physical injuries that my body was no longer the same. There were things that I could not do anymore. The doctors had to sit me down and say, James, your life physically is going to be different for the rest of your life. And I had to confront the fact that now I am changed and I'm not the same. And this is why it is important for us to plan on this reintegration stuff because how we return home is just as important as actually returning home. How we come back to this reintegration process, how we approach our homecoming is so important. It's not just parties and welcome homes and, and getting back to the things that we missed. When you come to Honey Lake, you give up a lot of autonomy. But as you get this autonomy back, whether it's something as simple as, as getting a, a Diet Coke from, or a cup of coffee from the store, whether it is something as simple as sleeping in your own bed or watching TV in your living room on the couch or taking trips with your family again, how we return home is as important as actually returning home. So as we look through the reintegration process, I want to encourage you to think about five things with me today, five things we're going to discuss in this class together as the, we look at the reintegration process. We're going to look at recovery, rest, reconnection, renewal, and restoration. We're going to talk about these five things together. And, you know, one of the things about 
pastors, ministers, preachers, whatever you want to call us, that we love it either when things rhyme or when they have alliteration, when they start with the same first letter. So thinking of reintegration, I wanted them to all be R words to kind of help them stick in your mind. So let's start with the first R word. The first one is recovery. When you come back home, you need to be able to take time to recover from what you've been through. Now, I realize not everybody can do this, but the longer you can take to go through the process of reflecting and re evaluating everything that you have been through and processing these experience, the better. And for some people, that may mean you have a week or two of vacation you can take. Maybe you have some of your family medical leave still available. Maybe you have the finances to allow you to take a couple of weeks, maybe longer, to come home and just slowly begin to ease back into life. I was very blessed that because of my time in the Middle East that I was not able to take any vacation, what they call R&R &R time, rest and recovery time. I had an entire month worth of paid leave saved up. And so I was able to take a month to, before I jumped back into my career and to, to get back into work and, and, and getting back into the processes of life, I recognize not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the finances and the resources and the ability to take a time, but even if it's just a day or two, to come home and allow yourself to just sit down and look over everything you've done. Get your notes back out. Look at all of the journals and the handouts that you've received to say, how am I going to come back into my normal life? So what does recovery look like? Well, it's different for everybody. But for most of us, it's going to be taking time to reflect on this experience. You see, at Honey Lake, the days are long, but the weeks are short. For most people, when they come to Honey Lake, the first week is usually a blur. Usually by the second week, you've got some traction to start climbing what I call the Honey Lake experience. I call it the Honey Lake Mountain. And as you begin to climb the mountain and you start making progress, about week three, you climb the mountaintop. Sometimes week four, you can see all of the things that led you up to the point that brought you to Honey Lake. And you also can see a path forward to move into a new season. And that's why I chose this picture that, that she's looking back on the mountains in front of her. That that's what I think is a beautiful picture of what reflecting on the Honey Lake experience is. That we need to go through this process of recovery to take time, if you can, as much time as, as you have available, to begin to say, who was I before and who am I now? What about me has changed? What about me is different? Is my character different? Is my identity different? How do I see myself now, good and bad? What parts of my life do I have to leave behind? And what parts of, of life can be new and changed? So we need to take time to recover. The second thing is, man, we need to take time to rest. One of the things that I love about the Honey Lake experience is how much programming is available, how many activities are on the schedule, how many classes, lectures, um, um, weekend encounters, all of these things. And there's not a single day off during your time at Honey Lake. There are times of rest, sure. But most of the time, you're so worn out and you're so overwhelmed. I, I think of the classes and the lectures and the material that we present here at Honey Lake like drinking from a fire hydrant. Man, there's just so much that there's no way in 30, 45, 60 days that anyone can truly process it all. And it takes time to rest. God created us with this idea of rest. And one of the struggles of the Honey Lake schedule is every week there's no true Sabbath rest where a person can stop and just do nothing for a day, but learn how to lean in and reflect and trust the process and, and go through each of the individual things that is, is something they need to implement in their life. So many times we need to, during this rest time, we need to allow our mind, body, and spirit to just sit here and marinate in all of the things that we have brought back with us. You see, the Sabbath rest that God asked his people and commanded them actually to follow wasn't just so they could take naps and watch TV. It was so they could learn to trust God. Because in their culture, 
the animals would need feeding, the crops would need tending, the stores would need managing, the businesses would need the, the, to be run, and the daily affairs of life of making meals and making clothes, all of these things had to be done. And God said that he wanted them to take one day out of the week to not do those things, and that meant trusting him to take care of what they could not. That's what the rest I'm talking about is. It's not just taking a nap and laying on the couch. What it is, is learning how to rest in God and say, God, then this new season, I'm trusting you to do the things I can't do. And just as we would take time to rest after a medical procedure, we should also take time to rest after this mental one. Just if, I, if I came out of a surgery, I would need to sit on the couch and allow my body to heal. This is the same thing I'm talking about with this rest that we're taking that allows us to heal. So what does this rest look like? Well, for some people, it may mean like this picture of sitting in a hammock. This looks restful to me, but not everybody rests that way. My wife does not rest by sitting still. She's a craft person. She's an action person. She wants to do. She wants to go see. She wants to go outside and get out of the house and go for a hike or things like that. And so whatever this looks like for you, it needs to be productive, but it also needs to be something that you allow yourself that time. As much as you can, not just to recover, but also to rest so that healing can take place. Digging into the traumas and the griefs and the losses in our life, that is painful. And after you go through these procedures, you have to, just like your body needs time to heal, your spirit and your mind need time to heal. To say, what is the new going to be like? How do I go through all of this and not just rest, but also heal. So rest is part of it. But as we begin to recover and rest, the third thing we need to look at is reconnecting. And this is what gets most people excited because returning home makes us want to reconnect with our previous relationships. And you may be thinking of interpersonal relationships like family and friends but this also can be mental relationships. How do I think about certain things in my life? Let's say that you came to Honey Lake to overcome and get help with a substance that you've been abusing. You may need to have a different relationship with food or social activities. Let's say that you came to Honey Lake to treat alcohol addiction and that type of substance abuse. Maybe alcohol has become your coping strategy and your soothing activity that you take to handle stress and to go through conflict and that when you start feeling overwhelmed or lonely or grie grieving loss that you turn to alcohol, well, you're going to need to have a new mental relationship with those things to say, instead of alcohol as my coping mechanism, what new coping mechanism did I learn at Honey Lake that needs to change? You see, my mind will actually have to change that relationship to say, okay, I can't go to those places anymore. Maybe a physical change. Maybe I can't go to, you know, I used to hang out with my friends at the bar, but now that would be unhealthy for me. So now I need to hang out with my friends maybe in our backyard at the fire pit, or maybe I need to hang out with friends at the gym, or maybe I need to, you know, go hang out with them at church or, or wherever, right? Whatever this, this new mind, body, or interpersonal, you know, this as reconnection needs to be done in a healthy way. Maybe this means that some relationships aren't what they used to be. Maybe somebody who it was not trustworthy, who betrayed you, you need to say, how do I reconnect with them in a healthy way? Not every relationship from your previous life was healthy or had proper boundaries. And we're going to talk more about boundaries in just a little bit. But what does this reconnection look like? I know that for my family, when I came home, reconnection took time. You see, I had not been in the home for a year. And so how did I reconnect with this? Well, for example, one of the things that I began to get frustrated at is one of the jobs I had before I deployed, I do the dishes. That was my job. And so one of the things that, that I had to learn how to accept was that my wife does not do the dishes the same way I do. She doesn't load the dishwasher the same way I do. And so when she loaded the dishwasher the way I felt was wrong, my initial reaction was to get angry and frustrated and say, no, this is wrong. You're doing this the wrong way. But I'd take a deep breath and say, hey, 
she has done this without me for a year. <laughs> Let's have some patience. Let's give some grace to this. Let's, uh, you know, as we reconnect to say, how can I help out? How do I begin to slowly take back some of the responsibility of the home? That was how reconnection took place, that, that I didn't just jump back into the old way of doing things. It took time. For my children, I had missed birthdays and music recitals and dance recitals and projects and homework, and I wanted to jump right back into the way it used to be, but I couldn't. And so now I had to make up, and one of the things that we did, and maybe this is a little silly, is they got to make up their birthdays with me. And now, of course, they didn't get all the big extravaganza, but we got the cake out and we, you know, went and had a little party, just us. And I got to, to sing them happy birthday. And that was fun. That thankfully, because of some leave and some money I had saved up, we were able to take a family vacation. And I know not everybody can do that, but this was one of the things we did to spend time together reconnecting and having them build back that trust with me. For one of my friends, when we came back, he was, you know, my, my bunk mate, and we, you know, talked a lot about our families, and he had a young child who was a baby when he left. Well, she did not recognize him after us being gone for a year, and it took a while for her to learn that this is, this is her dad. This is her father, and he's supposed to be a fixture in the home, but she didn't have that life. She'd spent a year of her baby, you know, infancy without dad in the home, and so all of these three connections took time. And so reconnection may be a place. How do I come back to work now? Do I still want to have the same job? Do, can I still work in the same field? How do I now have healthy social structures that maybe now I want to get involved with a church community? What does that look like? And how do I set healthy, you know, um, realistic expectations? That's reconnection. Number four, renewal. You see, returning home creates a desire to accomplish unrealistic goals. This is a silly thing, but one of the things that I fell in love with in the Middle East was having tea every day. That multiple times a day, we would stop, and, and, and especially when I was hanging out with my friends, that I, I'm acquaintances that I made over there, who actually lived in that, that was their home, that they would invite us over for tea, and they'd get these beautiful tea sets out. And we would have a cup of tea, and we would just talk. I loved that. Well, I set this unrealistic expectation that we would have tea every day in our home, that when we came home from school and home from work, I would brew a pot of tea and we would have tea together. Well, what happened when that didn't work out and the schedule was too busy and nobody took tea time as seriously as I did? I got frustrated. I got mad. And I, that was just an unrealistic expectation. A more realistic expectation was to say, you know what, we can't do it every day, but can we do it once a week? And that's a more realistic expectation. Coming home from Honey Lake, you may be tempted to, to have all these unrealistic expectations that I'm going to go to the gym every single day of the week because I could do that at Honey Lake. I was going to study my Bible for two hours a day because I had time to do that at Honey Lake. That I'm going to you know, make sure that, that when I set these goals that I'm going to get all of these things accomplished in a month. <laughs> that's unrealistic. We need to set realistic expectations. And so while there's nothing wrong with having new dreams, new goals, and new plans, that's a positive thing. But it's unrealistic to try to implement those things in too soon of a time frame or in too great of an amount. You may say, hey, now that I'm coming home, I want my wife and I to learn how to have healthy communication. So I'm going to teach him or her these I messages that I've learned in one of my classes, I'm going to teach my, my kiddos about you know, uh, thinking traps, right? the cognitive distortions, and I'm going to help them see these different you know, cognitive distortions that I've learned. Well, all of those are wonderful goals, but we might come home and we might just be overwhelming and spilling over into their life all of these mental health tools that we've learned. And one of the things that I hear all the time from, from families is, hey, you got to spend 30, 45, 60 days at Honey Lake. We didn't get to do that. It's going to take us more time to catch up to you. So one of the things that I encourage people to do is to set realistic and smart goals for when you come home, smart goals. And if you notice, the word smart is capitalized because it's an acronym. And you may have heard of this before. I'm not the, I didn't come up with this idea of smart goals, but what do I mean by smart? Well, each letter in the word smart stands for something. So when I'm thinking about life goals, are they smart? Are they specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based? 
So what do I mean by that? Well, if I just say I want my marriage to get better, that's not specific. Or even if I say I want my communication with my spouse to get better, that could be even more specific. I could say I want us to be able to handle conflict better. Oh, that's specific. I want us to be able to communicate better when we have conflict. That's a specific goal. How do we communicate when we have conflict, when we're fighting, when we disagree? How am I going to measure that? Well, before, whenever, let's pretend that my, my, when my wife and I were fighting, that we would always end the fight upset and yelling at each other. Well, I should be able to measure that. So now when this conflict is resolved, that we each have a peaceful conclusion that we both are in agreement on. That's measurable. That if we have this, that, that some of the measurements may be that we speak calmly. Some of the measurements may be that we use I statements. I, one of the, the patterns that I teach for healthy communication is the I pattern of I think, I feel, I want, because. I think that I do too much housework. I feel like the chores are not evenly divided. I want us to re-examine the chore chart because I want us all to get along and to be responsible for our home situation. I think I feel I want because. They have to be measurable goals. So that communication, I might say, okay, what are the measurements? Are we going to sit down and speak calmly? Are we going to use I think statements? Are we going to take breaks when emotions start getting very heavy? Those might be measurable things. And then are these things achievable? How soon am I going to say this? Well, you know, I'm not going to be able to do all four of those those you know tasks right away. And so is it achievable for me to do all of them the first time? No, no. But this first time, I may say, hey, do we agree that we're going to take a break and write out our I statements before we discuss this conflict and handle it together? Okay, we can do that one thing to start with. Is it relevant? If I come home and I say, you know what, man, I, I want us to, to have tea together. Is that relevant to my family? Well, maybe not. The, the, the goal is for us to spend time together and talk. If I have tea while we do that, that's not necessarily as relevant. So my goal, instead of saying, I want us to have tea every day together or at least once a week, I may say, I want us to have one time a week where we sit down, turn the screens off, and talk to each other. Ooh, that's more relevant to what I'm wanting. So why do I want us to communicate better when we have conflict? So that we can actually solve our problems and, and quit fighting and disrupting our relationship. Instead, healthy conflict actually can draw us closer together. And then, of course, it has to be time-based. So I may say during these weekly conflict discussions, we're going to add one of the four things every week so that by the end of the month, we have learned how to do all four of those things together. You see, SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. So when we look at this, man, what does renewal in our life look like? It means, you know, obviously, we know what these you know, root words and prefixes mean. The root word of renew is new. We have all of these new things we're bringing back, new ideas, new dreams, new goals, new things we want to incorporate into our life and our relationships. But re means to do it again. That lets me know this is a process. To renew myself is to make myself new again, and it means that I do it over and over. It's a cycle. Okay, I tried this first time for us to use I statements, and it didn't work. Okay, let's try it again. What, what, why did it not work? Because we didn't take enough time. Why did it not work? Because I did not give my, my, the other person enough time to talk before I cut them off. You see, renewal is a process. That's why I have this picture of a runner that most people, especially me, when I first started running, I, I was a distance runner for a long time. And I used to run marathons and half marathons and 5Ks, but I didn't start off that way. When I first started running, I could only run for 20 seconds at a time before I could not breathe anymore and I'd have to stop and take a break. But over time, 20 seconds became 30 seconds, became 45 seconds, became a minute, became three minutes, 10 minutes, and you know, eventually I could run for hours. You see, that's what renewal looks like. It is a process. It is something that takes time to do it over and over and over again until we smooth it out and make that process normal for us. So, so far, we've covered the first four steps. Let's look at the fifth one. 
The fifth one and the final one is restore. How do I restore the things that maybe I broke along the way? One of the sad and painful realizations that happens to so many of us here at Honey Lake is that we recognize when we look back on our life and what led us to Honey Lake is that we have hurt people. We have fractured relationships. We have sometimes actually caused physical, mental, and spiritual harm to other people. And we need to work to restore those things. Returning home may show us that we messed up. Returning home may show us that we missed opportunities. While I was gone, I didn't always speak kindly to my wife. And I can blame it on stress and I can blame it on the situation of the environment we were in. But we needed to sit down and I needed to apologize for some things. I needed to sit down with our girls and say, I'm sorry that my deployment caused us to miss out on things. You see, one of the things that happens in healthy relationships is you make emotional investments and emotional withdrawals. When I was deployed, when I've done things in school, when I've had projects due at work, I make emotional withdrawals and say, hey, I can't be there for that. Hey, I can't show up for that activity. I'm missing that recital. I'm missing that party. I'm missing that get together. But that means I also eventually have to make emotional investments and deposits. Otherwise, you can't withdraw what's not in the bank. Eventually, when I hit zero, I can't overdraw the account. They're going to stop giving me money until I put more money in the account. The same thing is true with our relationships. When I have broken things, I have to restore them. I have to fix it back up. And so taking time to reach out to those people and visit those places is important to the healing process. When I worked with military combat veterans to help them treat moral injury, one of the things that we have to work through is restoring relationships. Now, Restoration doesn't always mean we put the person back to where they were before. Sometimes restoration is not always possible. Sometimes restoration simply means I recognize that this is broken beyond repair. If I take a plate and I throw it on the ground, if it's just five or six pieces, I, I might be able to glue those back together. But if it's broken into a hundred pieces, it may be impossible to put that back together. Some relationships can't be put back to the way they used to be. They can be made new, they can change, but they can't go back to the way they were before. Not every mistake that we made can be fixed, but we can certainly try. One of the things that I want us to recognize is that starting small can lead to growth over time. When I used to work in gyms, I used to encourage people because they, especially people who would come in and they'd be severely overweight and they'd want to lose weight to get back into a healthy weight again. And I would help them say, hey, you might not be able to lose 50 pounds in a month, but what if you lost two pounds a week? That's eight pounds a month, right? And that adds up over time. In two months, it's 16. In four months, it's 32, right? And you know, as it adds up, man, two pounds a week turns to eight pounds a month. That's a lot of weight over time, even though at first week, two pounds may not make a big difference. So what does restoration look like? Well, it means gathering together and doing our best to right the wrongs, to truly apologize. Now, one of the things that, that I teach, and this is more in the Christian perspective, so forgive me for going too far down that lane, but there are three types of sorrow that we can experience. The first sorrow is what I call selfish sorrow. Selfish sorrow is what happens when we're sorry that we got caught. We're sorry that we, we're, we have to deal with the pain, and we just want the pain and the punishment to stop. That, oh, I'm, I'm sorry that I hurt you. Please, let's have a, a, a right relationship again. Please don't punish me anymore. You know, it's like the little kid who, or the teenager, that has something taken from them as a punishment. Oh, you stayed out past curfew. You don't have your cell phone for a week. Oh, you're a little kid, and you had a cookie when you weren't supposed to, so maybe you don't get dessert for two nights after dinner. Right? Those things are punishments and that produce selfish sorrow. The second type of sorrow is what we call worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow means I am upset that I hurt you and I fractured our relationship and I want us to go back to the way it used to be. Please forgive me so we can have a right relationship again. Now, to most people, that's very acceptable. But the problem is that's just operant conditioning. 
I learned that if I don't brush my teeth when I'm a kid, oh, well, then I get punished. That is selfish sorrow. As I get more mature, I actually end up saying, I'm sorry because I hurt our relationship. That is worldly sorrow. I'm sorry I didn't brush my teeth because that made mom or dad mad at me, and I don't want mom or dad mad at me, so I brush my teeth. As we get even more mature and we reach full maturity, we eventually get to the point where we experience godly sorrow. Godly sorrow actually means we have a desire to change, not because we want to have a relationship restored or because we don't want to experience a negative consequence, but we change because we recognize that is truly what is healthy and what is best for my life. See, when you're a young child, you get told to brush your teeth or you'll be punished. That's what most parents have to do with young kids. Eventually, they say, oh, brush your teeth, and they say, oh, I don't want to, to not brush my teeth because then mom or dad will be mad at me. But once they reach full maturity, they say, oh, I want to brush my teeth because I don't want my teeth to be unhealthy. And so that's what happens with a true transformation that I have godly sorrow that results in transformation that makes me a different person because I know that this is a better path. This is what's healthy for me. And that's what real restoration looks like. When we experience godly sorrow, we are transformed into something totally different. And I love this idea that, that Jesus talked about, the idea of seeds. He actually said that we need to have faith. Even if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can do amazing things. I mean, think about this little acorn. Acorns aren't that big, smaller than the tip of my finger. But when they're planted and nurtured, small seeds grow into big trees. Look at this big tree, right? How tall this oak tree is. It started as a small acorn. And so as we go home and we work towards restoration, don't be upset if that relationship is not 100% fixed overnight. It takes time. Even coming home after the new wore off, right? For the, when I came home from deployment, man, the, the new was, it was great for a few days to a week, even to a month. But as that 30-day mark hit and I began to go back to work and I began to go back to the normal schedule, man, the work still had to keep going. The new had worn off. Pastor Mark Brady said it this way, that dedication has to pick up when motivation leaves off. And that's what we have to do with restoration as well, that relationships and new life practices don't happen overnight. So as we get ready to close up our time together for this reintegration session, I want to give you some best practices. These are things I've seen in my life and in the lives of other patients who have come through Honey Lake, who have seen that these are the things that work well for them. Number one, I want to encourage you, man, give yourself grace. Give yourself grace if you don't get it right the first time. If you say, you know what, I lost my temper. I ended up, you know, trying to set this goal and say, man, I want to, you know, be kinder in my relationships. And man, I just, I, I was aggravated and I spoke in an unkind way. Okay. The, it happened. Don't beat yourself up over it. Change. Try again. You know, nobody gets mad at a baby when they're learning to walk and they fall down. Uh, no loving, kind parent chews their child out and yells at them for falling down the first time they try to take their first steps. No, they celebrate with them. They rejoice and they say, wow, you took one step and then you fell down. You took two or three steps and then you fell down. You took 10 steps, 20 steps. Eventually, you, you quit falling down as much and you start walking more. But we expect babies to fall down when they're walking. And so we should expect as we are in this baby phase, and that's not an excuse to go mess up. But it's given ourselves grace to say when we don't put everything into practice perfectly, give yourself grace. Number two, man, set realistic expectations. We've already touched on this, but don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't, don't sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to go to church three times a week. Oh, well, then when I only went two times, I'm a failure. Right? Oh, I'm going to make sure that I eat dinner with my family five times a week. Every weekday we're going to have dinner together. And then what happens when ball practice runs long or homework needs to be done or you have a project at work that you have to stay for? Oh, I'm a failure because I missed one of our five dinners at home together. That's just an un those are unrealistic expectations. To say, you know, what's more realistic to say every Thursday night is family dinner. And if Thursday night if something happens, if there's a ball practice or a game or a homework assignment or a work project, we reschedule and then we keep that second date. Right? That's a realistic expectation. 
Next, man, remember that the past is past. You are not your past. Do we have to live with the consequences? Absolutely. If I rob a bank and I get arrested, I'm probably going to have to go to jail. I might have to serve probation. I might have to say on my applications for new jobs that I broke the law. But I'm not what I did in the past just because I have to live with the consequences. The past is what we did, not who we are. That's not where we find our identity. The past has passed. We learn from the past. We plan for the future, but we live here in the present. Next, mourn and grieve for what is lost. Give yourself time as part of the recovery process and the rest process. Allow yourself to look back and say, some things are lost. I missed that funeral. I missed that birthday. I missed that recital. I can't go back and get it back. I can't go back and undo the hurt that I did. I can't go back and fix the mistakes I made. I can't change those things. So I have to grieve that those things are now lost. Maybe some relationships are broken beyond repair. Maybe some jobs and careers are now over. Maybe some seasons of our life have to change. One of the things that happened for me because of my physical injuries on that military deployment is the doctor told me, James, you can't run distance running anymore. You really shouldn't run at all if you can help it. Well, man. I had to grieve over the loss of that season of my life. Now, there were great things that came from it, better things, but I, I'm no longer, I'll never be a distance runner again. That's no longer part of who I am. And I had to grieve that loss and mourn over it. And so we should mourn and grieve over the losses in our lives. But we also need to dream and pursue what is new. So, okay, I couldn't distance run anymore. So I began to practice yoga, and I'm still not very good at it, but that's new. It's helping my injuries and my recovery. What else is new? Man, I, I learned uh, while I was gone, my girls got into dance. And so that's new for me. You know, I had to learn new words and vocabulary. Rejoice and dream and pursue new things. Set healthy boundaries. We're going to talk more about that in just a second. But setting boundaries, one of the things that God wants us to understand is that there is blessing in boundaries. It protects us. And healthy boundaries are not just the, the fences, the walls, but it's also the gates that we build to let certain people in at certain points. Next, hey, stay connected to your support squad. You need a support system in your life. One of the things that we see in the beginning of creation that God said is the first time God ever said something was not good. At the end of every day of creation, the Bible tells us that the Lord saw it and said that it was good. But the first thing God ever said was not good. He said it's not good for people to be alone. We were never meant to live life on our own. We were meant to live in community and family. And so stay connected to your support squad. Maybe it's friends that you connected with at Honey Lake. Maybe it's the alumni group. Maybe it's your family or your church community, your Celebrate Recovery group. Whatever that is in your life, stay connected. Because that's how you get support in those struggling moments of life, because it's not going to be sunshine, rainbows, and unicorn for the rest of your life now. There will be more struggles. There will be more temptations. And lastly, remember, it's a journey, not a destination. We can always get better. We can always grow. We can always develop and get stronger. And so you're never going to be 100% perfect in this life. And so don't focus on the destination. Focus on the, this step of your journey. So as we get ready to wrap up, I want to cover two final things. The first thing that I want to look at as we get to wrap up is I want you to, just to understand the four steps for implementing healthy boundaries. To implement healthy boundaries in my life, the first thing is I need to know who I am. If my identity is based on anything outside of myself, I can lose it. If I base it in my relationships, in my job, in my degrees, in my accomplishments, in my positions, in my titles, all of those things I can lose. Relationships can end. Seasons of work can come to an end. Titles can be changed and taken away. My identity has to come from the inside. Who am I on the inside? And when, that, when I know who that is, that can never be taken from me. It may grow and develop, but it can't be taken from me.
I have to know my identity. And once I know who I am, I can set my non-negotiables. So for example, one of the non-negotiables in my life is that my work can never permanently supersede my family. Family comes first. And so there are seasons, sure, where there are projects and, and weekends and things that I have to work and I miss out on that family time. But then what do I do? I tell my family, hey, I have to make an emotional withdrawal right now in our relationship, but I'm going to make another deposit next week. When this project is turned in, when this you know heavy weekend, busy weekend is over, we will make time to spend together. And so you, only you can set your non-negotiables. One of the things that in relationships that have been toxic before is you may say, hey, you, we can no longer speak to each other that way. That's a boundary. Or a non-negotiable may be, hey, if alcohol was a substance that I let be a, a unhealthy coping mechanism in my life, then one of my non-negotiables may be that I don't go to bars and clubs anymore. Places that serve alcohol you know, for the majority of it. Right? There's, I can't go to, to get togethers where alcohol is going to be served because I just can't, I can't handle that temptation. So that's a non-negotiable in my life. Whatever that is for you, you have to know your identity, set your non-negotiables. And this is the most important thing. Practice, practice, practice. Right? Wash, rinse, repeat. Michael Jordan did not become arguably the greatest basketball player of all time just because he had talent, just because he had skills. He had to practice all the time. The, the, the people that knew him would say that even after the team was done practicing, he'd stay another hour or two practicing free throws and layups and his own personal skills. We have to do the same thing in our lives. We have to keep practicing these skills, whether it's communication, whether it's cognitive distortions, whatever, whatever skills we're learning, reframing, all of those things we have to do, we have to practice them. And once we develop those first three steps, we can begin to add in gates to our boundaries. There are certain people in my life that have access to certain areas that other people do not. I think about this, and maybe because I'm a military guy, I think about this like a security clearance. I have a secret security clearance, but I don't have a top secret security clearance. So there are many things I have access to, but there are also many things that I don't have access to. There's some documents and areas that I can't go into because I don't have that level of clearance. And the same thing is true in the lives of other relationships that I have. Some people I'll, I'm able to trust to get a little closer to me, but some people have not earned that trust yet. And they can only come to a certain And some people, even if I trust them, there's some material they don't need to know. Right now in my children's lives, they do not need to know what our household income is in our budget. That's just not something they need to know right now. There are certain areas of my past that they don't need to know. One day, someday, as they grow and mature, I can share that with them. But right now, they don't have that access. So I have to learn to build gates in those healthy boundaries. So as we get ready to finish our time together, I do want to share this one well-known passage from the Bible with you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church community in a city called Corinth. And they are struggling over the fact that many of them started off the Christian life and then they went back to their pagan life. And now they're coming back. You see, in the culture of the time, to be a, a craftsman, meant you had to belong to a guild. So let's say that you were a silversmith. You'd have to belong to the silversmith's guild. And many of these guilds, guilds worshipped pagan gods. For example, the silversmith's guild worshipped the Greek goddess Artemis. And so if you wanted to have a job as a silversmith, that might mean going to the temple of Artemis and offering a sacrifice to her. Well, let's say that I started off as a Christian and I realized, wow, being a Christian means I can't worship Artemis anymore, and so now I have to lose my career? What's that going to mean for my family if I can't bring home any money? Am I going to be able to keep our home and to feed them and put clothes on their back? So maybe I give in and go back to worshiping Artemis so I can keep my job, but then I come back and say, oh man, I regret that I turned my back on following after Christ and the way he wants me to live, and, and I want to come back to him again. Well, they were struggling with this coming back to God again a second time. And this is what Paul tells them. That means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And he tells them, hey, the old life, the past is past. 
don't live there anymore. You see, the word that we use in the church word repent means to change how you think and act. When we repent of our past life, we change how we think about those things. We change how we act. And so one of the things that we have to do is we grow in this maturity and say the past is past. I'm not that person anymore. God has given me a new life. And as you leave home or leave for home, you leave Honey Lake to go home, I want to encourage you to say I'm living a new life. Old things have gone away. The old life is gone. I don't live the way I used to. I don't have relationships the way I used to. I don't see myself the way I used to. I have a new life that has now come. And I have new ways of living with my family, new ways of seeking after my goals, and new ways of seeing myself and my identity and what my life is going to be for. So I hope this, this, this has been something that is helpful for you. If you have questions, you say, James, this was a great class, but I need more help in a certain area. Maybe you want to explore a certain topic more. Maybe you need help with moral injury or identity or any of these things we've touched on, setting boundaries, whatever. I'm glad to help you. This is my contact information. Please don't hesitate to send me a call or a text message or send me a text message. Give me a call or sending me an email. Anything I can do to help. And of course, anybody on my team would love to help too, but I am so thankful that you took time to join us for this session today. I hope that it blesses you and encourages you. And remember, like we talked about, small seeds grow into big trees. This is a process. This is a journey. And I'm so excited for your journey as you prepare to leave Honey Lake. I hope this helps you create a plan. As we talked about before, failing to plan is planning to fail, and I don't want you to fail. So, I pray that this blesses you. I pray that this gives you the tools you need to be successful. And if you need help, man, we're right here. Don't hesitate to reach out. Have a wonderful, wonderful next season of your life. And I pray God's richest blessings on it.